let's go ahead and get started. Um, I hope everybody's had a great DevCon uh, so far today. Um, I'm Mark Bastian. I will be talking about an idea called interactive uh, code development or application development with reloadable code. Um, rather than spending a lot of time trying to explain what it is and isn't, I thought the best thing to do would be to simply motivate um, the concept with an example. And I tried to pick something that would be extremely, extremely simple, extremely trivial, so we can focus more on the concepts than the application itself. So think about how you might develop, if, if you were tasked to develop a, like a desktop application to just convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius. So you've got a text field for each, and you need to enter one in, it pops out the other one. So super easy, right? Um, so the first thing you're probably going to do if you're doing it in Java is you're just going to, at least if it was me, I would say, all right, I'm going to stub out my application. I'm going to have a JFrame with some defaults. And then I'm going to uh, save that. And then I'm going to run it. And it's going to compile and uh, pop up my frame, which, <clears throat> again, there's nothing, you know, nothing exciting going on here. Um, just to show that, OK, it's kind of a sanity check. But I'm ready to move on to the next thing. <clears throat> so the next step, then, is I'm going to close my little uh, boring application. And I'm going to add some UI elements to it. So I'm going to add a, uh, maybe a box layout with some a Celsius label and a text field and Fahrenheit and text fields for that, and then use a, some kind of box layout and put all that together. And then I'm going to do the same thing. So again, I can't see my application. It's all that's in my head what I think I'm doing. I'm coding it up. I'm going to save it. I'm going to run it again. And it's going to compile it and pop that up. And now I have my application. This is not a talk on UX or what things should look like and what pretty is and is not. It's a functional interface, uh, visual interface that has the two things that, I'm, that I want to put on there. Um, at this point, I could type in there and put whatever text I want. There's no validation. There's no model. Um, but I know that, OK, that, that, that looks good, so I'm going to close it. Now, my next step, and again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to show all the code for this. You know, it's, it's more to demonstrate the concept. It's like, OK, now I need some kind of a domain model. So it's a temperature converter, so I'm going to make some kind of a uh, temperature interface with the various methods I need for my conversion. You know, nothing, nothing fancy here. I'm going to stub that out into some kind of a, a model. Um, and then I'm going to add an instance of that into my uh, application. So this is all in my code. And again, I haven't run it again yet. I'm just um, kind of stubbing out what I think my application logic is going to look like under the covers. And um, put that in there. So nothing special. Um, and now I'm going to kind of go on to these additional steps. And so I'm in this iterative process where now I've got my model, I've got my user interface, which doesn't do anything. And so I need to wire everything up. So I'm going to uh, add some listeners. So I need to add some listeners to the text component so that when I type in a number and hit enter, it updates my model. I need to add some property change support to my model so that when it receives an update, it propagates that change back out to other aspects of the application, like the other box that I didn't type in to update that. Um, and every time I do that, though, as I, as I add more changes, if you're, if you're like me anyways, you're going to add some changes. It looks OK, incrementally a little better. I'm going to run it. All right, that looks pretty good. Um, and then I'm going to close it, and I'm going to continue that process. Um, some aspects of this, particularly for something that is not trivial like this, and most of you probably don't work on trivial applications, um, you are going to get to a point where not only are you going to fire it up, but you need to get your application some kind of a state to test your current feature. And so there's more work involved. You bring it up, you tweak your application, you get it in the right place, then you try it. Hopefully it works. If it doesn't, then you need to close it, make your changes, restart it again. And every time, though, it's this constant cycle of I, I type, I save, I hit run, compiles it, pops up the application, I test it, and then I rinse and repeat. So think about what if instead I could launch my application just one time. So to bring it up, visual application, the first time I bring it up, it's just an empty square, you know, JFrame um, in this particular example. And I could update my code in my editor. And so if I've got hopefully enough screen real estate, I can have my editor in one area and my application in the other, make some changes. And without going over and refreshing the application or touching it or doing anything to it, immediately see the effects when I, when I save my code without having to to go through all that other all those other steps, um, while preserving state. Um, so it's not just I save it and it refreshes everything. You know, if you're doing like JavaScript editing in a, in a single page application, maybe you save everything, but then you have to reload the app, and that may refresh all your state as well. We want to keep our state, and so that really is what this concept of reloadable code is all about: is to get away 
from what I just showed you and to get into this paradigm of being able to say, my code is up and running all the time. I want to make changes to it and see everything as I'm moving along. So what is reloadable code? It's kind of a rehash of the two slides ago, but long, an application in a long running process, kind of a supervisor process. You make changes to your code. You do something to trigger a refresh. You save the file. You send, you send a text to a REPL, which I will talk about in a minute here, or basically a command line uh, shell. Um, changes are propagated. And so you no longer have to worry about some of the kind of the tedium that you have to do. There's no manual client refresh. Your state does not get lost. You don't need to relaunch anything. Um, there's a couple things we're going to need. And again, this is not a talk on, uh, on, on the guts or the plumbing of anything under here. Um, I really want to uh, kind of show a sample of how you can do this, some examples of it. And hopefully, if you're interested, you'll go, you know, tonight you'll run home and start doing it. Um, you know, go back to your desk and do it. Um, but a couple things you need to do to make this to make this work if you're looking for how can I do this. I'm going to do all my demos in Clojure. Um, I'm sure this can be done in, in other languages if you've got a favorite, but that's really kind of what I focus on. But you need an interactive environment. So that's the first thing. You need something that launches the application that kind of supervises it while you make your changes that, that says push everything out and do my reloading for me. I need to be able to separate my concerns if I have a strong object hierarchy with uh, fields, methods, property chain support, and all that, and I need to change one thing, I've got everything all like glued together. So in order to reload that, I kind of have to refresh my entire application, reload all of my classes. So we really want to be able to say, I'm storing my, my values in my application. So let's say it's this temperature conversion app, you know, the, the 100 degrees or whatever. I'm storing that separately from the thing that converts it to a Fahrenheit or a Celsius or a Rankin or whatever scale we're using. And then finally, state state and value are kind of a kind of sometimes hard to distinguish between the two. But state really is the idea of value over time. How do I keep track of how the the thing that I care about changes as I as I interact with it? I want that to not be reset every time I do something. So now what I want to do is spend the rest of the time just jumping through some examples. Um, I'm going to so we can not jump back and forth between slides. I'm going to preview the examples and then we'll go look at them. So the first thing I want to do is show how I might code up the application that I was just talking about um, reloadably. And that, again, is uh, it's uh, a sw swing. So it's an application. It's a JVM application. Um, I'm going to show another example that's a single page web application. The underlying technology is called FigWheel. It's a closure library. Um, aside from that, I'm probably not going to say FigWheel again for the rest of the talk. But basically, I'm going to be able to save my changes. And then it will immediately propagate to my browser without me having to go refresh the browser, or tweak any knobs or buttons or anything. It just does it. And then finally, I'm going to, um, hopefully if time permits, uh, talk about Quill, which is a third demo, which is a uh, library that will uh, compile down to both JVM bytecode via Clojure, or it will transpile over to JavaScript if you're writing it in just generic Clojure, Clojure script. Um, with that, let's go over here and start doing live coding. So hopefully, they always say don't not to do this in a talk, but I like to, I like to do it. So let's see. To show you what, I'm, what I've got here, I have three separate kind of window frames here. On the top, if you can see my cursor here, oh, hey, that's great. Um, on the top is uh, my namespace. So this is just where I'm typing my code. On the bottom, I have what's called a REPL a read, evaluate, print loop. Um, if you are familiar with uh, Clojure, Scala, uh, the Python shell, uh, Java J shell, it's the same type of idea. It's something where I have a running process where I can go down here and I can type commands. You know, I can say plus, you know, th two and three, and, and you know, I get five. So you know, it's not super exciting. Um, you know, I can print, oh, caps lock is on print, uh, hi, and it prints it. And so this window above just has my results. And so most of you have probably played with some kind of a dynamic uh, environment like this before. Um, the thing I'm really talking about to distinguish what we're talking about today from just, just you know, dynamic programming is that um, most of the time we, you, know, you, just, you type something, you see the result. Um, here I'm actually talking about having an application with state that we're coding along with it. So what I might do here is I might say, all right, I want to make a JFrame. Um, frame, and then I need to import that. And so I'm going to be typing in closure. I, I, I believe when you look at it, it'll look fairly readable. 
I know some of you are going to see that the parentheses are in the right place compared to whatever language you're used to. But uh, anyways, um, so let's see, 800, 600, and then we'll say is that visible true. So if I do that, it says I've got a J-frame. You can't see it because it pops it up behind. Here it is. I can interact with that. Now, one issue with this particular J-frame is it doesn't, I, because I don't have a, a value assigned to it, I can't do anything with it. So um, what I would really rather do is say, um, define this, and we'll just call it a frame. And then we'll pop that up. And then what I might do, I don't have a lot of screen real estate here. But what I might do is if I had a, a, you know, a larger desktop, I might arrange everything so I can see, <clears throat> see it better. But what I could do here is I can say, all right, to my frame, what I want to do is I want to make it smaller because it's a little too big. So we can say, we'll say 400 by 400. And then there's this revalidate command. You probably, if you've done much swing development, you won't use it very much. But this allows us, when I've got something kind of live like this, it allows me to uh, refresh everything. Revalidate. There we go. And oh, there we go. just made it smaller behind the behind my app. And then what I might do is say, due to my frame, um, add a uh, let's let's add a J button to it. Press me. Add that. And then, okay, and if I do that, um, see, my hands were not on the, on the typewriter, and it, and it did it, so it um, popped up, so kind of cool. So typically, though, when I'm doing interactive code development, I'm not going to do it all there at the, at the console, at the REPL, I'm, and because I want to keep my history of, every, of the things I'm doing right and not the things I'm doing wrong. So if I'm in extremely experimental mode, I'll be down there at the shell typing things in, most likely what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to have a namespace where I'm going to be uh, typing all of my code in, saving it, and then sending it to the REPL. And so I will be doing that. And so I've, I'll be doing some hotkeying here that will send things down to the REPL, and then you'll see the, uh, see the application being developed in real time. So the first thing I'm going to do is I have this uh, converter namespace that has the various functions I've defined already for converting between my various temperature scales. I have a singleton app, JFrame. I have a state, which is defined independently using something called an atom, again, beyond the scope of this talk, but um, it's a way to independently manage state in an application to close your way. Um, and then I've got a couple fields defined. So I'm going to go ahead and load this and make it my main application. I'm going to move it over here where we can all see it. And make this a little smaller. OK. So. Um, <clears throat> So if I were doing this again interactively, I brought this up. What I now want to do, and I can go down to my REPL and I can say, show me the state. So my state has a Celsius of 100, so that's my internal state, how I'm representing my, uh, my domain. Um, what I might do next is add fields to the app. So rather than typing everything out in an error prone way in front of everybody, I've, I'll just remove the comment and show how you can do it. So to my app, I'm going to change its layout. And I'm going to add the labels that I showed before, the Celsius label. I'm going to add my Celsius field, my Fahrenheit label, and the Fahrenheit uh, text, set, text field. And then add that. Whoops. There we go. So I just did that, popped it up, populated it with what was in my state. And then what I might do next is add a couple actions. So I predefined this add action function, which adds an action listener to my various components. So to my Celsius field, whenever you click it, it's going to update the state by associating the field Celsius with the contents of the text box uh, read as a value. So I do that, and I'm going to do the same thing down here with my Fahrenheit box. Only under the covers, I'm not going to have a, a Fahrenheit and a Celsius field. I'm just going to store it all internally as Celsius. Um, now, you didn't actually see anything there. And if I go over here and change my code, you also aren't going to see anything. Uh, but if I do this, let's change it to like 34 or 134, and I go look at my state again, it is actually updating. So I have correctly wired my, I've set up my, uh, my listeners connecting my UI down into my application state. So the very last step in this uh, is to then go and add what's called a watch, which is similar to property chain supports, but it's much simpler. 
that says, uh, watch my state, and when the old value is not equal to the new value, update the text fields. So I'm going to do that. Now let's go up here, and let's pick some number. Let's say 100 should equal about 212, and it does. Um, I, in this particular application, I convert down to absolute scales and back up, so there's going to be some floating point uh, errors there. Um, I can say 32 Fahrenheit should equal 0 Celsius. Um, I think like 37 is like <coughs> human body temperature. Um, I can also, if I want to, if I have an application that's wired in so I've got everything wired up correctly, if I want to tweak my internal state and see how it affects my UI, I can do that too. So I can go look at my state here. And so the state is properly updated to 37. That's the last thing I typed. I can also do this. I can say swap uh, state uh, associate uh, Celsius. And let's change it to like 50. So if you take a look up at the UI, if I hit enter here, it should oops, hit enter. It's going to change it to 50, and it's going to update the Fahrenheit field as well. So I have full, full control over my application. I have my hands in the state. Um, everything is up. There's no need to ever reload, refresh, close, open kind of thing. It just automatically just I change it, reload the code line. So now let's switch gears to something a little more interesting. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to look at a uh, single page web app. So I've got this Tetris clone that I've been working on. Um, I have two REPLs here. I have a closure REPL and a closure script REPL. Aside from the fact that one compiles down to Java bytecode and one transpiles to JavaScript, they're identical. Um, so under the covers, it's all, it's all the same. Um, <clears throat> so the cool thing with this is I've got this application running over here. I can make changes in my, uh, in my code editor, in my, in my REPL, save it, and it will automatically propagate over to the browser without me having to refresh anything, change the state on anything. Um, and, I have, and, I've, and I've got a connection over to my browser, so I can do things like I can say JavaScript alert, um, you know, hi, DevCon, and do that, and it pops it up. Um, so what I want to do then is I want to switch into my namespace where my code is. So now my REPL is connected into where I'm editing my code. I've got this render function. And just to show you some of the basic things you can do, so right now the falling block is orange. Let's make it. Uh, let's make it green. So I save that, and it changes it to green. I can change it back to orange. The way this is being rendered, um, if you see over here, you can see it says div h1 svg it looks like HTML. It's just a closure data representation of HTML, and so it renders it <coughs> into the DOM. And so uh, basically, you're writing you're writing HTML, but it's getting closure. So some things I might want to add are uh, maybe a score. Again, most of these things, rather than typing them in raw, I have them in as comments, so that way I can uncomment them and show that as if I were to type them correctly in front of you, this is what would happen. Um, so I save that, and it shows my score and high score. Um, so this is, you know, it's a graphical game application, but if you're doing something, you know, more businessy where you've got fields and editors and all that stuff, it works, it works exactly the same. Um, can anybody see a problem with my Tetris game? Like, why it would be boring? They're all squares, right? So let's fix that. Um, so what I, what I need to do is I need to examine the state of my application. And what I want to do is look at the keys of the state of my application. And let's see. Oops. My hot keys are different on my desktop than on my laptop. So I have to remember which is which. Um, so the keys, so for my state, again, by convention, the name is state. It's not always called state if you're in closure. Um, I have these various fields, frame, speed, score, high score, lock, shape, pause, shape. <coughs> shape looks like a pretty promising thing to inspect. So let's say the shape of the state is 1, 1. It's just like this grid. It's a vector of vectors, and it's 1, 1, 1, 1. So it looks like whoever coded this uh, uh, encoded everything as kind of like a bit mask pattern where you know, one might be filled in and maybe something else is not. So let's try that. So I'm going to say swap state, um, associate the shape to be, and just as a real quick test, let's try 1001. And sure enough, I changed that. 
live. So pretty cool. Um, but again, when it drops to the bottom, it's going to recycle because it's going to pick a new shape. So I don't want to do that, right? So what I really should do instead is disable the following action so that I can actually um, tweak things before they before my, while my state, you know, not only do I want to preserve my state, but I want to pause my state if I, if I need to, right? So, um, so if I do this, okay, I've, my state is now paused. I can go over here and move this guy left to right. Um, so let's change some of the shapes. So in Tetris, everything has four cells. And so there's like a, I know there's a shape that looks kind of like that. So I can do this and move it back and forth, spin it around, that seems to work. Um, and so there is both a, a J shape, so that looks kind of like a block J. And then there is, if you look over on the right, there's like a transposition difference, so it may not look exactly the same. Don't worry about it. Um, by design. Uh, anyway, so uh, you can do that. I can also switch it to the other side and do that. And then um, if I want to actually interact with my application, I can go over there and actually you know, play the game and, and, and do stuff with it. Um, and so I can, but I can change my shape to anything I want to. And so uh, rather than going through the exercise of developing all these shapes, um, I do have in my application, if you go up, you will see that there's a map that has all the shapes. So as you were, if you were to pause the action like I've done here and go through and say, oh, I like this shape, I like that shape, you could go up into your code and then add entries into this map. So rather than, again, walking through it, entering them all, I'm just going to uncomment. If I do that, then I should, uh, if I go over here and slam the piece down, I should be at new, new pieces, and sure enough, I'm getting all my uh, all my different all my different shapes. So I should probably turn it back on again so it's falling. Oops. So imagine having an application with fairly elaborate state, um, and you can do basically have absolute control over it um, in your in your editor, and you can look at the state, inspect it, tweak it see what's going on, pause it. Um, so you kind of have you know, absolute power over the application. Um, rather than thinking about, OK, what's the next thing I want to do? All right, now I'm going to add this shape, and then I'm going to refresh and rerun the whole thing. If I add a new shape, I have a, you know, one in, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have seven shapes. So I have a one in seven chance when I add a new shape um, at that point of my next shape popping down being the one that I just added. And if the shapes were to grow, it's even less likely. So I want to be able to go on there and say, all right, just, just tweak it until it, you know, the way I want it, stick it in there. So, um, so there's Tetris. So now let's switch gears again. And I think I'm done with my closure script REPL. I go back to my closure REPL. Um, I'm going to show a <clears throat> Game that I worked on, it's a lunar lander, lunar lander simulator game, I guess. It's not really a simulator. Let's bring that over here. And this is done under the covers with a library called Quill. Quill has something called a sketch. If you're familiar with processing, which is a Java library, it's, it's based on that. Um, and it has initial callbacks you set up for uh, and for the initial setup of your application state, what, how you draw, how you update, and so on. Um, and then once you wire those up, at that point, once you go and make changes to your namespaces and reload them, any of the code that you change automatically gets propagated. So, um, so I've got this game, and it's not very fun because I'm supposed to land it. And even if I turn my thrusters on like full blast, I always die. So it's kind of a lame game. So what I need to do is go over to my simulation namespace and figure out what might be the problem. And I have a gravity of, minus, of, 300, G, of, of 300 meters per second squared. So, so it's a little too high. It's like, it's like a, a solar lander, not a lunar lander. <laughs> so, um, so what I'm going to do is go down here and once again put in where I pre-wired 
something that I could do live where I say, all right, what I want to do is I'm going to make it so that, oh, I better, I should actually load my namespace and then it will reload the code. There we go. And so it's just going to fall, but rather than crashing and me having to restart and crash and restart and, you know, forever, um, and I only have like, you know, a tenth of a second to do it, I'm just going to make it so once it's a certain level, it's going to pop back to the top. Um, and I could do this with the typical, you know, uh, run it and reload it kind of thing, you know, with, with a hit the run button, but, uh, but then I have to run it every time I want to try something different. Um, so let's go up and try. It is a lunar lander, so we should do justice to it and say um, lunar lander. Um, it's kind of boring. If I uh, hit turn on the thruster, and if I go off the top, by the way, I die. Um, so it does not take very much thrust because the gravity is so low that I die, so that's kind of lame. So let's try a different gravity, maybe like uh, Earth gravity. So it's it's really a, a Terran lander, I guess. And then this one I can do. My goal, by the way, is to uh, land on those little red squares at the bottom at a certain velocity. So I can't just be like, oh, red square, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and uh, go for it. But I was saved by my little uh, conditional loop there. So let's try that again. Let's see. Oh, red square. <laughs> uh oh, got to reload it, don't I? OK, this time it's going to work. OK, so all right. But now that I have debugged that, what I want to do is go in here. And this time, I just want to pause the action. So I'm going to set my time delta, my simulation, to 0. So it's going to pause the action. And what I really want to do is spice my game up a little bit. So I'm going to go over to the render. And I'm going to say, uh, let's make like my, my thrust like a lot bigger. And so to do that, what I really should do is have it always be visible. And so if I do that, I just turn it to true instead of when thrust is on. And then uh, I want to make it like really big. And so here's the height of the thrust. So I'm going to say times five and reload that guy. And that doesn't look right. So, but fortunately, I don't have to reload, relaunch my application, right? I can just go and like mess with where, <laughs> what I think is wrong. And I think it's this translation. So I think if I move that down a little bit, let's try that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But we, it, it's like the same red as the, as the landing platform. So let's make it a different color. And so now it's kind of a purple color. I like that. And then also, you'll notice I have these super long decimal places up here. I don't like those. I'm going to change my, my renderer to use uh, actually use some, some appropriate formatting. So if I do that, see that it went down to truncated to decimal places. And then now I'm going to reinstate my thrust. Now I should, oh, I need to go back and turn my simulation back on. And then, so now I can try to go over here. Um, and we have until 3.30, right? OK, so um, that's the end of that. Unless you want to watch me try to land. Oh, I died again. Um, So, so those are some just different examples of reloadable code. But hopefully, you get the idea that we're not talking about. You know, there, there's a couple of ex extremes. I think often we think about. You know, the the I, I edit, I save, I run, I, I see how it looks, and I rinse and repeat until I get what I want. And then there's the whole. Um, uh, well, there's like the dynamic scripting thing. But if I do that, if I'm just running from a shell, whatever language or technology is in, I still need some way to manage state, to manage the UI, whatever that is. Um, and so this is kind of in the middle. It has, it has kind of the best of everything. And um, you know, it's interactive. It is uh, very productive. I mean, you think about the time that you've saved by not having to redo all those, you know, that rinse and repeat loop. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, so give it a try. Um, all of the code, all the slides, everything here is at this uh, Git repository here. Um, do you have any questions for me? Yes. Say that again. Some of the frameworks that you use, like Angular CLI, mm -hmm. will give assistance for you. But if you want to roll your own for Java, is there a Java and JavaScript engine? So the question was, was uh, some some frameworks like Angular give this to you, and like what I showed you here gives this to you. What about you know Java? Things that aren't designed around it. I am going to say as a caveat. 
Um, there are definitely libraries, languages, technologies that are designed around this and things will work well. The, things, the, the, the last two things I showed you today, not the swing one, will work very well. Um, I have not played around with Angular, but someone was telling me earlier, Angular, I believe, uh, I believe React also. Um, some of the other libraries out there, JavaScript library that sounds like especially have support for this built in. Doing it in, uh, on a, in a J-frame, I would often probably just have my code there and my name is based and just keep popping it up, but without having to relaunch everything, that's kind of a closureism. But um, the first example is primarily to drive the, the contrast. Uh, mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. So good question. Yeah. So with Swing, what if you wanted to like, what if you need to remove a listener or uh, you know something like that? How do you do it? Um, that is part of the um, kind of the why Swing doesn't lend itself super well to it. Um, what you could do is have it up there, and you know a lot of your additive elements you can do anything that you want to remove. You're probably going to want to keep a handle to it. You know, define a variable for that, and then you can remove it later. But Swing, you again, Swing you can do it. It wasn't really designed around it. Um, it certainly, I think, in many ways, will give you a faster build time. But um, it's not going to be quite as slick as some of the uh, you know, languages, technologies, and libraries that are designed for it. Mm -hmm.